I kind of had this this long regulated life in terms of regulation through work and regulation through being married. Everything was very calm. This is how it's done. And suddenly I found myself thinking, actually, I'm forty something now. Can't screw it. But but not not screw it in a I'll take stupid risks way. But if I think I want to do that. I'll just go and do it. And actually, being selfish and doing that might actually make me a better person. That was one of the biggest things I learned, was that, that the selfishness, I, I preach this on YouTube a lot, you're better off being selfish and becoming a better person for those around you than you are thinking you're not being selfish, but then being a, being a useless person. But sometimes just thinking, I'll look after me, actually has benefits to people that you think would be disadvantaged by you looking after yourself. Mark, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. At this point in your life, how would you describe yourself? <laughs> uh, how would I describe myself? I would describe myself as a, well, it would depend who's asking, but as it's you, a 48-year-old fitness YouTuber. That, that might be it, actually. There's probably more to it. That feels like a very brief description of myself. Uh, a 48-year-old YouTuber father of four grandfather i was i was going to jump in and be like mention the kids mention the kids yeah yeah i probably should do that yeah yeah um yeah father of four grandfather of one uh husband to a wife um i sound like um uh russell crowe in gladiator um, husband to a bored wife and well that malarkey um yeah that's pretty much it though i I'm, my life is very very simple i i, I do youtube uh, I, I run around i try and stay in shape and it is, I've got it to a point in my life where it is as simple as that. There's not an awful lot more going on than, than just me mucking about on YouTube. I, I actually think it's great it can be that simple because <clears throat> when somebody asks me that question, I kind of have a bit of a meltdown and, and don't really know what to say, which is something for me to fix and not for us to fix today. But I, I've, I've been there. I've had times in my life where I, yeah, my life has been uh, complicated. Uh, right now, at 48, it has never been, probably when I was 10, was this simple uh, but but not since 10 years old has it been this simple I think what led you to financial services when you were 21 22 I believe it was yeah I was 21 okay so jumping right back um, super simple I was a I was a lifeguard from the age of about 12 or 13 because uh, a my mother was a swim coach at the local pool and B back then there were no rules about 12 year olds being lifeguards so I was a lifeguard for, for years that got me into fitness because place I worked at, the pool I worked at, had a gym and occasionally the guy that ran the circuit training classes would be off and because I was very tall I looked a bit older than I was so they had me sub in for him so I used to run circuit training classes which was basically shouting at people to do press ups while Bon Jovi played in the background, that, that was it, um, sports science. Uh, and then I had a child, my, my daughter when I was about 20-ish um, and I discovered rapidly that you can't raise a child as a lifeguard um, financially. Uh, or you can, and they'd be a really good swimmer, but they wouldn't have any food to eat because it doesn't pay very much. So I thought I need to stop doing this. And I literally picked up the newspaper and back then, mid nineties, you could walk into any financial services company uh, and just start selling financial services. It, it was as easy as that. In fact. All my friends, everybody my age, in Reading where I live, uh, had, has at some point worked in financial services. Some of them for a day, some for a month, but everybody would go through that system to see if they could do it. Because in the mid nineties, if you if you could, um, if you were the, 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 the very small number of people that could do it, uh, could tolerate it. Uh, as, a, as I say, could do it. So there's a skill to it. Could tolerate doing it. Um, it was it was it was lucrative, but. Um, but it required a certain type of person. So there was no no intrinsic draw to it whatsoever. It was pure necessity that got you there. Yeah, they, there was no no need for. I had I left school at sixteen with GCSEs only. So it was the second year to do GCSEs. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, after O levels was finished. So I had my GCSEs. Didn't want to do A levels. Um, I, I never took my GCSEs out of the envelope. They got delivered to me. <laughs> so I went, I went off my interview for the financial services and they didn't even ask to see they didn't care about your GCSEs they just cared that you could uh, articulate yourself and potentially sell to people that was it so they said yeah you know, join I think I, I joined on I think I joined on a basic of like 11 or 12 thousand a year which at the time 
coming from being a lifeguard was was astronomical money. I mean, it sounded to, to me. I thought I can live on that um, and raise a child and so on. Um, and then they, you know, obviously sales. The, arguably, the sky's the limit. Um, in fact, actually, that was the advert that I applied for. The advert was a, a blue sky, and the, the, uh, it was the sky's the limit. It tells how much you can make. I mean, that, that's how they used to advertise financial services back then. That, that's how the job was advertised. It wasn't. You can provide this amazing service for your clients and yeah, help them become financially independent and stuff. It's basically just, do you want to earn money? Um, and, and as a 21 year old um, with a Wall Street fixation, I said, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very much so. Thank you. Immediately. Yeah. And lots of it, please. <laughs> it's, it's fair to say that you, you, you stuck it out in the industry, but along the way, you probably didn't love elements of it day to day and stand up comedy was something that you explored at certain stages along the way wasn't it and was that a form of escape from a job that you didn't didn't necessarily love intrinsically and you just want to fill that gap or was it a hopeful i want to try and make this something for my future it was it was literally both i i never enjoy i i actually i enjoy is the wrong word i've enjoyed many parts of, of financial services there are just the other night i was sat with a client um leaving the industry so, so I was kind of explaining what I'm going to be doing in the future and basically saying goodbye after 20 years of looking after him and had an amazing time we, we, we literally had a five hour a meeting's the wrong word it was just chatting to a friend for five hours um, I love that aspect of it of helping people and getting to know people and so on so I enjoyed lots of it but I never loved it I never I never I never loved it but I got into a financial rut because I got very very lucky very early on in the, in the early late mid late 90s if you did have um, effectively the, the, the gift of the gap, really, that was what it was. If you, if you could talk to people um, and they, they trusted you, you, you could do very well financially. So very quickly, I was in a position where um, even two or three years in, I was looking around thinking, I don't really enjoy this, but what else could I transition to with zero qualifications in anything else and get paid what I was getting paid? And the, the answer was absolutely nothing. So. Uh, so I, I, I was, that was it, I was, I was stuck. And obviously by then, of course, the companies are very clever, uh, well, they were then, they would encourage you to buy the fastest car you could and have the most luxurious holidays. Leverage. So that, yeah, so that when you thought, do I really want to do this? You thought, well, I need to do this because I've got to pay for the, the Porsche or whatever it was. I mean, literally, that, that's how it worked. On, your, on day one in the industry, they said, what car do you want? You know, get it as soon as possible on credit and never leave. Um, so I couldn't leave and and yeah after about 10 years I just thought this isn't fun in fact it came down to, to this I had been on a course uh, many years before when I was a fitness instructor ish and we were being taught about I was about 18 we were being taught about how heart disease was the biggest uh, killer in the northern hemisphere and it was me and a couple of my gym bro buddies learning this. And one of them was South African. And he said, Pete is there, he said, oh, thank God I'm from South Africa. Southern Hemisphere, he's fine. And we were just bored and stupid. So we started laughing at his stupid joke that annoyed the instructor. And we just laughed and laughed. And you kind of laugh, we just crying with laughter. Anyway, jump forward, 10 years on, I'm in the financial services. And it suddenly dawned on me that since that day, I've not laughed uncontrollably about anything. And I just thought, oh my goodness, I can't be whenever I was 28 and 29, probably put me on 30. I think I've, well, I'm never gonna laugh again. What can I do to be funny? So I, I just went and did stand up comedy. Um, I mean, that, 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 which makes it sound like I just went and did it, but that's kind of just what I did. I just sort of went to clubs where you could just go on stage and, and tell jokes and, and did it really it wasn't, there wasn't a lot more to it than that I think at the time Ricky Gervais was just becoming quite popular um, and he's from Reading and so I just kind of thought well he's from Reading and he's quite funny um, and I'm from Reading and I'm, I, I, I thought I was quite funny there you go sorted off I go I'll go and be, a, I'll go and be the next Ricky Gervais um, I actually found myself very quickly just at 3 o'clock in the morning in a pub in East London telling jokes to a barman and a dog and, uh, and thinking, actually thinking, this is really, this is really fun. I, mean, I was having a great time, but I was working all day, doing my day job. Uh, by then I had 
probably three of my four kids. I then jump in the car, drive to London, do a couple of gigs, travel around London, and then have to get home um, via uh, Mr. Cod at Sandwich Junction at four o'clock in the morning to get a, a chicken burger because I hadn't eaten all day. And before I knew it, I was exhausted and fat, basically. So I thought that this just doesn't this doesn't work. I have to stop doing the comedy. Um, and I told myself it's because I'll never I'll never make it, which is probably true. That there, that there is a barrier to entry beyond open mic nights. That is things like promoters. Does your face fit? And does a guy at the TV studio like you and stuff? I got I did okay. I got um I did a couple of TV shows and stuff, kind of low key stuff. It wasn't very nothing too exciting. Um and and so I said, I'm, I'm never gonna, I'm probably never gonna make it true. So I'll stop. Had I been 20 and discovered that world, I'd absolutely have tried to be a stand-up comedian. There's no question whatsoever. But uh, but I wasn't. I was 30 something, and um, it was it was just probably almost certainly never going to happen. Um, so so yeah, I walked away. I walked away from from fun <laughs> uh, and, and, until literally until until YouTube. That that was. Um, well, hang on a minute. I might be able to. Uh, do be creative and, and funny without having to drive into London, uh, avoid getting um, mugged and uh, and a parking fine, and uh, and actually and actually communicate with more people than a, a barman and a dog in one go. If I were to start YouTube, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. I, th- I thought two two good. people and a dog would be just just double my results. <laughs> and it's uh, it's become quite exponential recently, but we'll, we'll, we will get to that. But I think. You've said very, very confidently that you just sort of walked from one thing into the other. And do you think the the confidence to be able to step on stage and start doing go- gigs in what I can imagine was back then a bit of a Larry East London crowd? I wouldn't stand up and, and try and do stand up comedy in East London these days, even though I'm quite a confident young man. But you just seem to walk straight in without any hesitation. Do you think that confidence came from the day to day reiteration of trying to be confidently trustworthy to the people you were liaising with, or was it something you've always just had? It came from two things. I, I, cause I, I thought about this. It came from two things. So first of all, it came that the, the confidence I got of being 15 years old and being told, can you go and run that circuit training class and being 15 and having to tell people in their thirties and their forties, um, old, old men, <laughs> um, do your press ups, do your sit ups, you know, burpees, star jumps, seal dips, whatever. That that made me confident. I had a little baseball cap with coach on it, and I, I thought, you know. So I felt confident doing that. And then going into financial services and sitting at 21, 22 years old, talking to people in their 70s and their 80s who had made sometimes millions of pounds, what they should do with their millions of pounds, and being given millions of pounds to invest sometimes also made me feel very confident. So I, I had a confidence um, from doing that, and just just I just knew from from experience that if you look confident, you sound confident, you say to someone, "This is a good thing to do," whether it's a press up or an investment. Um, as long as you genuinely believe that, um, then, then then they'll do it often, and, and so you should. You know, you know, I was right to feel confident. But the other thing was that part of me didn't care if I failed because when I went. To go and do sound of comedy, there was almost it, it, it did seem like a slightly ridiculous thing to do. You know, I was explaining to my friends, um, yeah, I, I, I'm, what are you doing tonight? I'm going to do sound of comedy. It sounded like a stupid thing to do when you're a financial advisor. So I thought, what will be handy is if I go and do it, and I'm absolutely rubbish, because then I don't need to go and do it again. Like it's kind of a self-solving issue. Like if, if I, it's like test test driving the car you really want and thinking, oh shit, I really like. Yeah, this. absolutely, it. exactly that. It's I mean, exactly that. I've, I've, for example, when I first test drove a Tesla, I, I remember thinking, I hope this thing sucks because then I won't want one, and, and obviously yeah, it doesn't. Um, so I, I went hoping to be rubbish, and almost immediately was okay. I should add, when you go to an open mic night in the, on a Wednesday evening in London. The, 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 the competition, for want of a better word, in, you know, the bar is low. Um, you're, you're, you're trying to um, be funnier than the, the guy who just went on, who's often drunk and useless. And, or, or, or there's a lot. When I was doing it, there was loads of youngsters were doing it. So lots of sort of 20, 21 year olds. Although I, was, I wasn't particularly, I was only in my 30s when I was doing it. I had four kids and a job and a mortgage. And so I was able to do stuff that was. Um, about that, I was doing jokes about being married and having kids and stuff that that nobody else was doing, and so um, it, it kind of it, it worked. And I was also doing loads of 
I was very self-indulgent in my comedy. I, I, I would go and do jokes that only worked if you grew up in the 80s. And so sometimes if you're doing a joke about whatever, I had, a, I had, a, I had an amazing lethal weapon joke. So if you're doing jokes about kind of 80s movies and stuff and it hits the right crowd, suddenly you're laughing. Um, and so I started getting booked for uh, proper gigs where the average age is a bit older. So, because they would go, oh, yeah, actually, yeah, this, this stuff will work with people in their 30s and their 40s. And that 21 year old university student doing jokes about the, you know, the night bus and, and getting high, that won't work. So, which is why I got TV gigs. I mean, I, I got TV work purely because my stuff was just a bit, a bit um, well, a bit more relatable to a, a demographic that's more likely to be watching TV. So, yeah, I went in expecting to fail and not more than if I did. And then as soon as I discovered that actually I was doing all right, I was very confident because I was doing right. And people say, oh, it's the most terrifying thing. I could get up on stage and, and you know, I'd be terrified. You are for, for momentarily, but the minute people laugh, and at a gig, they laugh. Quit. They want to laugh. I mean, people, uh, when you, people, people's expectations, you get up on stage and everyone's sat there wanting to hate you. They're not, not really. Um, they want to laugh. That's why they're there normally. Um, so you don't have to be that funny even, you can just go, and I'd get up on stage, for example, this is how easy it is, I'm six foot six, every stage I got up on in a, in a, in a cellar, in a, in a London pub built in, you know, 1400, my head would be touching the roof almost every time, because um, I'm physically too big for a cellar anyway, let alone on a stage in a cellar, so I'd just make a stupid joke about, you know, oh, I, don't, I don't fit. Um, and that's as easy as that. You get on stage, you stand there, and you kind of go, oh, I don't fit. People laugh because it's funny. There's a bloke on stage, and he's too big for it. And immediately they're laughing, and then, then you're away. So I found it, I just found it quite easy. Um, and, and in fact, when it went wrong, and, and as it does, and nobody laughed, um, by then I was so, it had been so easy that I almost thought, well, you're wrong audience like oh, well, I'm laughing this, this stuff is amazing it must just be the audience tonight so I had a an elevated ego that came purely from being quite lucky early on with my stuff just happening to work with with the people that were hearing it um, I imagine if I'd gone in early on well if I'd gone in early on and people hadn't liked it I'd have just thought well I am rubbish and I'd never gone back to it so an observation of mine is that you are excellent at laying out the top line points and making an individual laugh at the start of your the first 30 to 45 seconds of any YouTube video and now hearing the way you've just described the comedy stage of your life I'm assuming that is a conscious decision to get the audience to laugh to bring them in to draw them along because once they've laughed it's an easier job Absolutely. you have to do uh, is, that's a skill you've learned from, from years ago it's, it? the idea I decided I, I forget how long I've been doing it but on my YouTube videos fairly consistently like for example you, you'll know from YouTube you're told things like don't have um, don't have intro scenes and stuff and, and, and get to the point really quickly. And I always thought, no, I, that might be right. I would rather have less people watching, but have a cold open with a joke and then a little intro scene and then start my video. That's just the way I want to do it. Uh, that's the way friends always used to start. Cold open, they have a funny bit that's completely unrelated to the rest of the show. Then you have the Friends intro, and then you're watching Friends. It's the way, that's just the way. It's the US, of, US Office, uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. There you go, so, 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 so don't they? bringing it to a more modern era, exactly that. Yeah, The Office, the American Office, perfect example. Cold open, joke, unrelated to the rest of it. And then, and then into the, that's, the, that's what I grew up thinking, this is funny. And if some 15-year-old kid that's grown up on TikTok that wants you know instant something doesn't like that, that's cool. Don't, don't watch my stuff. People, are, people are, of an older generation are watching my stuff anyway. Um, so yeah, I like the idea that, um, that yeah, people just laugh because I don't have huge skills um, in the in the subjects I'm talking about. I'm not a I'm not a uh, I'm not a great athlete. I'm not particularly knowledgeable about fitness. I mean, everything's above the average normal person, but it's not. It's not, um, it, it's not your level, as a, as a simple example, no, nowhere near it. So I did think very early on, what on earth are I, what, what, what is my, what's unique about me? I thought I'd just tell jokes and stick some 80s movies clips in. ka -ching. 
<laughs> which you do very effectively. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I did laugh when you said I had a great lethal weapon joke because I'm like, it's probably been woven in somewhere along the way in, in, in a video here or there, whether it's been split up or whether it was delivered. It never has actually. Ago. It was. It was. Um, no, it oh. was because uh, I, I, I hold I hold my lethal joke, weapon joke quite close to my heart. As I say. like, it's got. A, I don't want to kind of prostitute it out through YouTube. It's got. A, it's got. A, it's sentimental to me, so it will just. Well, if I was a if I was a tabloid journalist now, I'd demand it from you, but I will not, and we'll move it's on. A, it's, a, it's, a, so it's actually on YouTube. YouTube. I, I used to have a, a different YouTube name that has about four of my four of my stand up videos on it. Um, I don't even remember the name I used, but somewhere on YouTube, on a, on a name that nobody would ever better track down, does exist my old stand up. Um, but uh, yeah. Keyboard keyboard typing. Yeah. So, 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 some, somebody over at 4chan is now. <laughs> Plowing their way through millions of hours of footage. Yeah, yeah I'm there. Some. <laughs> and they'll find it. They, yeah. they will find it. They will find it. But but YouTube health and fitness is obviously a huge part of that. Yeah. You've already mentioned that you were working one full time job. You were coming home via the, the the sort of fish and chip shop on the way home just to get your meal in for that day. Ultimately, you were as you've described overweight in your late twenties, yeah. early thirties, and that ultimately led you to health and fitness. So, what was the the volta, the turning point for that journey into health and fitness, which is now such a big um, part of your life? I, just simple stuff. I, I got to the point where I was a forty six inch waist trouser, and and I was and it was getting too tight, so I thought I need forty eight inch trousers. Um, that's just ridiculous. I can't. I mean, that's just ridiculous. I was I was twenty three stone I mean way way over 300 pounds um, and, and I kind of got there and no one really helped me because I'm six foot six it sounds ridiculous but but 350 pounds on someone that's six foot six in, a, in an expensive suit doesn't look too bad um, I, I got away with it and people would ridiculously say to me like you're on a diet you need to be on a diet I go, what? I'm 23 stone what? yeah yes I need to be on a diet um, but then I, I just wasn't happy with myself now my kids were getting older, uh, they were kind of running around, uh, jumping into, into, they wanted to go to the paddling pools and the swimming pools and stuff, and I felt self-conscious about doing that with them. Um, I can remember I went to Alton Towers, and we stayed in the hotel with the shoot thing, in the swimming pool shoot, and me and my kid, George, he's 21 now, we got in the little dinghy thing that goes down the, the chute, and it got stuck halfway, not, not because I was literally filling the chute, it just got stuck. But the two of us had to basically walk down this chute in full view of everybody. And I just looked like this. I, I looked like I'd caused the chute to get stuck because I was too big, because I was a huge person. I just thought, this is this is um, this is a bit embarrassing. Um, and it was just little things like that. They just all added up. And so I just thought, uh, yeah, I, I literally got to the point where I thought I'm, I might die. I only got to the point where I thought, if I died, People would go, that's sad, because he's not very old. But I don't know that everybody would have gone, that's amazingly surprising. You know, uh, it would always be, well, yeah, he was 23 stone, and, you know, no, no wonder he died. And um, that's quite a scary thing, because I'd always, when I was young, I'd always thought there's only two reasons people work out. When they're young, they work out to get laid, and then when they're old, they work out to not die. That, that's kind of, that's why you stay fit and healthy. You want to look good, because sex, or you want to be healthy because because um, age and, and death that that's it, and I kind of got lost in the middle. I never really realised when I kind of transitioned across, but suddenly I did start thinking, "Oh my goodness, my, my I always don't care how I look, but I genuinely am worried that I might have a, a stroke, a heart attack. I mean, those those are things that do happen to people that are grossly overweight, um, and I don't feel at all ready um, for that to be my my um, my out." At, at, 36 or something stupid so I just started jogging and it was literally as simple as that I just I just thought I'll go jogging um, which people said to me don't jog you're too heavy but I thought no, that's perfect because I'm so huge jogging is going to be massively hard work um, so what I, I, when I was a lifeguard we would have people come into the pool who were appalling swimmers out of shape and they'd swim up and down looking like they were drowning and people would, we, we would laugh at them. But part of me would think, fair play, that guy who looks like he's drowning is probably burning a thousand times more calories than the triathlete who's wishing up and down without expending any energy. So I was always very aware of the concept that even if you're pretty rubbish at something, um, when you then try and do something, you always get more benefit from it. So me jogging around the block 
was um, was was as hard a workout as I'll do now. Just you know, I, now I have to go and run you know 20, 30 k to get the same feeling. Um, but I found it very easy to lose weight because you know you, you, you take a twenty three stone body jogging, and um, and it comes back healthier. <laughs> Assuming it comes back, um, I always made it back. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> Phew. <laughs> That's the main thing. Yeah. That's the main thing. Yeah. It, no, it was touch and go sometimes. Use. I mean, I was, I was a mess, but um, but yeah, the progression was quick. Which, which is rewarding in and of itself. So I can imagine, how, how much weight do you lose in, in your sort of first first round of weight oh, loss? Was, was it a constant process with the fluctuations? Yeah, how did you get I, on? I went from, I went from, um, I can't work in pounds, because easy, I went from, from sort of 330 pounds, I just about 100 pounds, probably the first, less than the first year. I mean, it was just, it was mad. I had, uh, I've always genetically been kind of big and broad, so I'd, I never kind of had that sort of skinny fat thing going on, but I wasn't, in any way toned up. I mean, I wasn't, I, I didn't look great, but um, I was I was down to wearing sort of, you know, 34 inch jeans and stuff, almost within the first year. So the, the weight loss was quite easy. And also I, I, I employed everything. I did keto, intermittent fasting. I mean, I did, uh, and back then it was kind of Atkins. I, I did everything. Um, yeah, it was, and, wasn't it? Yeah. And actually, which was useful, because that, that taught me a lot about the benefits of the inverted commas of, of that type of fad dieting in that nowadays people say, oh, well, intermittent fasting, it's only because of calories reduction because you don't have breakfast. Yeah, good, <laughs> doesn't matter. Whatever whatever the fad, however the fad worked, I just rattled through them and they just kept working. I'd get bored of one thing and thought, well, I'll, I'll do something else. Lost all the weight. And then, yeah, within within a year or two thought, oh, I'm actually, I'm actually now a normal human being size size um what can i do and, and i just started thinking oh my park run that i'd been doing which was like a 42 minute 5k i, I wonder if i could get sub 40 and i did and i wonder if i can get sub 38 and then i just got hooked on um on progressing with running and so i spent a big big chunk of time probably from when i first started losing weight right the way through until a few years ago 2019 probably just running. I was. I just. I liked the idea that I was completely inappropriate for it. I looked too big. I looked silly. Um, people talk actually on YouTube. They talk a lot about imposter syndrome and feeling that they are. Um, they're, they're kind of you know. Oh, am I? Do I deserve to be here? Because I was a grown man, I had no issues with imposter syndrome. I liked standing at the front of a park run and people thinking, "Should you be here?" And me thinking, "Screw you." You know, I, I don't care. I, I like looking like the imposter. It became quite fun, especially as I got quicker. Um, I think, yeah, I do deserve to be stood in the middle of a park run pack, and I'd come middle of the pack. So I just progressed. I yeah, just basically park run. In park run, I've, I've said it many times. Park run. Um, I mean, it saved my life. Sounds dramatic, but but I, I don't know if I was twenty three. Twenty. If I was no, twenty three. You're, you're not alone. Still, you're not alone. There's, there's, there's countless. I, you know, I'd be a mess. I certainly wouldn't be where I am. I wouldn't have. I know. I've, I've went through a divorce. I've got remarried. I, I, I um. <laughs> I wouldn't have remarried the way I remarried if I was twenty three stone. Um, my wife will assure you of that. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> it, it it was during that period of time, wasn't it? That you remarried. It was um. It was sort of the exact time. I'm not completely sure, but it was during. Yeah, that, that I just kind of finished process. the weight loss process and was then getting into. Um, I, I'd kind of. Tr- I was transitioning from. Basically, there's three stages. Lost the weight, got serious with the running, and when I say serious, serious for me, um, I was never commit, yeah, Com- committed. Yeah, committed. Yeah, committed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Every weekend, I'd be out doing a run, a uh, race, uh, and then I transitioned into um, a bit more of a, to use you know, your phrase, a hybrid athlete. I like the idea of thinking um, I can do something a bit more than just just running. Um, because it's fun, isn't it? This is an, this is an argument I often have with road cyclists who can't comprehend why you do anything other than weigh forty five kilos. And spend I like I there. like the idea. Yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's kind of a, it's, it's always cliche, but the idea that yeah, come the zombie apocalypse, whether I need to run away from the zombies or swim away from them or, or, or beat them up or you know pick up a heavy boulder and throw it on the head, I can I, I won't be the best at any of those one things, but I'll be more competent than average at all of them. 
Um, and I like that. And also, it was at a time where my kids were turning teen, teenagers, and, and they were getting into fitness, and fitness had very obviously become what it is now on YouTube, which is, and fitness is, it's, it's not what I grew up thinking fitness is, it, it's purely aesthetics. Um, and it was almost as a reaction to that. I, I, I'm just thinking, I'd go running through the woods with my dog. I'd just think to myself, there's someone else there. But I'd be thinking, no, screw the world, this is fitness. Um, running, dog, if a tree falls down, I can pick it up and shove it out of the way, that's fitness. Not looking in the mirror, worrying about my, whatever, tricep separation, uh, blah, blah, blah. I, mean, I, I That was annoying me. Probably more than it should do, because I've got teenage boys. Um, who are getting sucked into that world, and all, and all that goes with it? No, I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm in the I'm in the same camp, very much in the same camp. Where I, I I got very lean once when I was younger, enjoyed being that lean, but then actually reflecting upon the way I felt about that leanness, I was looking at myself at eight percent body fat, thinking, oh, there's so much more to go. You can keep pushing, keep pushing, and then only when I came out of it, and I thought, whoa, <laughs> blacked out for a moment there. This is not healthy. And now performance goals, I think, are much, much more psychologically manageable and much more intrinsically valuable and give you a lot more long term as well because especially with the the TikTok generation and everything going on now it's very very difficult to know where you stand in this incredibly jacked teenage world that's going on yeah. so no I completely, it's a, it's completely a, with you on that side of things I mean it, yeah it's a, it, it's not my world at all um, I don't um, I don't understand it and it never used to be. I mean there's somebody that was so I was a teenager in the 90s you know to me fitness was was, was watching superstars, Brian Jacks doing dips, or, or Daley Thompson at the Olympics, that, that was fitness. Um, and I've said it on YouTube, Daley Thompson, who was, when I was a kid, fittest man on earth, you know, he, he getting his gold Olympic medals, and he wouldn't get on Love Island today with his physique. I mean, he would, he'd be laughed out in the studio if he went to audition. They'd say, where's your six pack? You know, you, you're, you're out of here. Um, you're not fit, inverted commas, enough. And, and that, to me, is just, bonkers that kids grow up thinking oh well that's that's fitness that isn't it just yeah mind boggling no i agree it's the it's the uh it's the stigma and the the, the misrepresentation that i'm trying to work against as well so power to us <laughs> yes. people in this case <laughs> i think but during that time when you you ended up getting remarried and the weight loss sort of came to a head jen your wife decided she wanted to go off traveling didn't she and you thought right i'm gonna do the same and you had a reflective trip to Namibia where your perspective on a few things vastly changed, didn't it? Did yeah, I, mean, I, I was just a very childish. So I, I um, because I'd come out of a of a long, long marriage where we did everything together, like a like a, an old married couple would, and Jen had come out of uh, university pretty much where she just did whatever she wanted. For her to think I go off on holiday with my mate and her girlfriend and they just want to go to Peru was no big deal. To me, I was thinking. What a holiday without your significant other? That's unheard of. Uh, how rude! Um, so I always, I, 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 as a as a childish reaction, I said, "Well, if you do that, I will go to Namibia and ride a motorbike solo around the desert." And I thought she'd say, "That sounds incredibly dangerous. Don't do that. I won't. I won't go on holiday. We'll do something together." But she said, "Okay, um, I'm off to Machu Picchu." Um, <laughs> So, so, so what was it? Oh, it was it was literally that. I, my expectation was that she would not go, um, and, and but she did. <laughs> so then I thought, oh, let me go. I, I now need to. Um, I hadn't been to motorbike motorbike in sixteen years at that point. I thought I now need to go on a literally on a course to learn how to ride a motorbike again. And then I did a two day course, and a week later uh, landed in Cape Town and picked up a motorbike and rode it into the Namibian desert on my own for a month, uh, which was. Bonkers! I mean, just uh, the most stupid. Uh, dangerous is the wrong word because it was it was incredibly safe unless something had gone wrong. It wasn't like I was doing dangerous things every day. But just riding through the desert, if you fall off, you you uh, people would say, "What happens if you fall off?" But well, the answer is you you die in the desert. I mean, there, there isn't really an awful lot else you can do. Um, you aren't walking out of there. So yeah, I did it and I, and I was successful and it just, yeah, I, I just, I came back from that trip just thinking, oh, hang on a minute, I'm, I'm old enough to, to do whatever I want. I, I, I can, you know, there are, there are no limits on what I can do um, within reason. I, I kind of had this, this long, 
regulated life in terms of regulation through work and regulation through being married. Everything was very calm. This is how it's done. And suddenly I found myself thinking, actually, I'm 40 something now. Um, kind of screw it. But, but not, not screw it in a I'll take stupid risks way. But if I think I want to do that, I'll just go and do it. And actually, being selfish and doing that might actually make me a better person. Um, that was one of the biggest things I learned was that, that the selfishness, I, I preach this on YouTube a lot, that um, that you, you're better off being selfish and becoming a better person for those around you than you are thinking you're not being selfish, but then being a, being a useless person. So I, I've got friends that, that spend every single weekend watching their kids, whatever, play football badly or something. And I'll, and I'll say to them, oh, by the way, you're grossly in way, you're out of shape. When are you going to start jogging? You keep telling me, I can't jog because I've got to watch the kids and play football. Well, no, let the kid play football. Why don't you play football and go for a run? Well, what if I miss him scoring a goal? Well, what if? You know, he, what if what if you have a heart attack when he's 15 years old because you never did go jogging? You know, so sometimes that's a simplistic example, but sometimes just thinking, I'll look after me, actually has benefits to people that you think would be disadvantaged by you looking after yourself. People say to me, what are you doing with your kids? Why are you into Namibia? Well, my kids were teenagers, they looked after themselves. I, you know, I got home, the house hadn't burned down, they were still there, um, and they had a happy uh, dad as a result. Um, you know, would they rather have gone on a holiday with me? Yeah, maybe, but they didn't. Um, they, they didn't, and had they done so, I'd have been miserable because of my holiday with my kids. Um, and I'm not in Namibia on a motorbike. So you know, I'm a big believer in just thinking, Look up, and this is a lifeguarding thing as well. Someone's drowning, the very first thing you do, what's your situation? Because just jumping in to save them, you know, are two drowning people potentially. So, are you safe? If you're safe, then fix them. And the same in life. I wake up every morning, what do I need to get done today? Because once that's sorted and, and, and catered for and, and planned, then I can make sure that my wife, and my kids, my dogs are okay. If I'm waking up every day a mess, and just throw myself straight into helping others, still a mess. We've now just got too many drowning people. Agreed. And I think this selfishness, selfishness becomes a bit of a currency for future service as well, whereby the more work you do or the more selfish you become, bless you. I mean, this is something I genuinely think about now is I, I'm quite antisocial in the way I live my life now. I don't probably spend as much time with her and my fiance as conventional couples would at our age. But she and I both understand that the more I can almost front load my suffering from a work point of view, the more I can be of service later in life when we have children and when there's there's more things going on. So it's something I'm very conscious of. And I think Johnny, my business partner with Omni, is a very good example whereby he knows and his wife understands that the Johnny that comes back from six hours in the hills on a Saturday, whilst it means that she's got to do all of the, the sort of child sitting and managing that, is a better Johnny for the rest of the week until the next Saturday. And that is a better thing overall than Johnny just flapping day to day, thinking, oh, I wish I could be in the hills, I wish I could get that headspace, and maybe missing a meal or being late to pick up a kid or all these little things, as you've said. So I think it's a, a big lesson for people is, yeah, selfishness can actually be a very good thing if it's administered in the correct way. And you've obviously uh, clearly sort of covered that with the Namibia side of things. But I think that... that that turning point where you thought, right, I can do what I want, I don't need to be so regulated, was ultimately the seed that planted, I start making YouTube videos. Well, it wasn't, was it? It was actually a bitterness towards your, your son that made you yeah. want to start YouTube videos. <laughs> but I, I think the seed that was planted was probably what, what made Yeah, the, 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 yeah, I, the, the, yeah I, I, I keep telling stories that make me sound like a, a, a kind of petulant um, child. Um, but, but, but they are what they are. <laughs> So yeah, but I know what, what happened. So go back to Namibia. Actually, with Namibia, I, I I had a little GoPro. In fact, I've got it somewhere on my shelf of old cameras. I had a little GoPro Hero session. It's a little tiny GoPro camera. I had it on my helmet, and I'm riding around Namibia, filming the desert. And I'm riding around thinking, this is amazing. I'm looking at stunning things every day. My mind is being blown repeatedly. And I get home, I look at the footage on my computer, and actually. It's just the same desert for eight hours of footage every day. And it doesn't quite, I, I remember thinking, that's really annoying. I should have filmed that better. I should have, I should have, how could I have made that better? I like to be creative. How could, how could I create something better? That coincided with my kids saying to me, just out of the blue, oh, I had a thousand people watch one of my Minecraft videos or some nonsense. 
um, I want you know, I, that's good of me, isn't it? Yeah, praise me, Dad. And I said, well, we, it must be easy to watch. It must be easy to get a thousand people to watch a video because nothing you could have created on that stupid game could possibly be of any real value. Um, and he said, no, 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 that's an outrageous thing to say, Father. Um, uh, you couldn't get it. So I said, well, I bet I can. So I I bought my iMac and my camera, and I spent thousands of pounds. It was like, I'm going to crush this kid. No, two yeah. pounds per view. <laughs> yeah, oh, this kid is, this. I, I tell you, two pounds per view would have been delightful. It was, it was expensive per view. So I spent a lot of money. And then me and Jen went to Africa um, because after the Namibia chip trip, Jen decided to take her motorcycle license and just go to Africa with me. Um, I kind of lucked out with her, that was very handy. So off we go to Africa, um, I filmed it, I filmed it properly, got off the bike, talking to camera, I kind of, I made a YouTube video. I knew nothing about YouTube. I literally watched some YouTube videos before I went to Africa to see how it's done. I was watching Casey Neistat videos back then, was I was because my kid told me, watch this guy. So I watched five Casey Neistat videos and then went to Africa. Uh, on the plane, I read the Final Cut Pro tutorial to learn how to edit videos because I didn't even know what a cut meant. I didn't know what, to me, cut was like what the director shouted. I didn't know what that meant in the context of editing a video. Um, came back, made a video, stuck it online, got a thousand views eventually, and uh, and, and thought, ha, I beat you, kid. So that, that was... Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's a significantly <laughs> lower ROI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, he doesn't understand that. So, so well, he didn't then. Um, so, so screw him. So, and then I was left with this YouTube channel that was just kind of, it had these two videos on it for me riding around Africa, which genuinely were quite well done. It disappoints me now that I can upload a video today and it will have, within a couple of hours, more people will watch the, the number of people that have ever seen those videos. It's quite annoying if people don't go back and watch the, those videos, they're great. Um, I'm quite proud of them. Um, I thought, what do I do with this channel? It's just this kind of empty channel. That, uh, and I thought, well, at the time, I just started doing some Spartan races. Um, I thought, I know, I'll stick a GoPro on my head and I'll, and I'll film that and stick it online and see if anybody watches it. And that, that, was, prob that was the start of what YouTube became. I mean, it wasn't really a, it wasn't a fitness channel. It was me riding motorbikes. Um, but, but my first Spartan race, I suddenly thought, oh, fitness by someone that isn't typical fitness YouTuber. If I tell a few jokes um, to make up for the fact that I don't know what I'm on about. Um, smoke and mirrors, smoke and mirrors. <laughs> yeah, make, make them laugh, make them laugh. They won't, they won't, they won't spot that I'm talking nonsense. Um, and, 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 that, and yeah, that, that, that worked. And it worked very quickly, better than the motorcycle and stuff had done. Um, and also, you, I say it worked better. I was getting very into Spartan, so I put a lot of time and effort in, into it. Um, and, and yeah, and, and so that, that, that was in a direct transition from there to, to where, where it's gone now. And then January the 1st, 2020 was a big turning point as well, wasn't it? And something I'm, I'm quite interested to hear even now, how symbolic that is to you upon reflection with everything else you've achieved since then. Uh, yeah, my park run. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's still the most symbolic thing ever that, that I've fitness wise ever um, I've done some pretty cool things fitness wise uh, but that that's all, basically I, I ran under 20 minutes for a park run and, and some people clearly many 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 people can run under 20 minutes for a park run but there's not many people that are, that are six foot six are still 220 pounds um, 46 47 at the time and had previously been running park runs at you know, 42, 43 minutes and had no history of running before I started running in my 30s. There aren't many people with that history that, that go and run a park run uh, under 20 minutes. Um, and that was the point where I thought two things. I'm very happy with what I've done. Uh, and it also dawned on me that I was above average. And um, I did a video where I mentioned how I had no desire to be any faster than that. I, I didn't care if I never got quicker than, than 20. In fact, I still haven't got much quicker. I'm only about 30 seconds quicker today. So I I'm, I'm explained that uh, I thought it would be really useful for people that were where I was thinking, oh, I can never, I can never be um, where I want to be, to sort of focusing on being elite or superb or worrying about what the truly exceptional athletes are doing on YouTube. 
and just focus on being above average. Go and get your parkrun times, which you can download for every race anywhere, or your local 10K times from the previous year for the race you're at going, and look down the list and see where is the person out of 400 runners who came 199, who's in the top half? Because that time is achievable by anybody with reasonable health and fitness and a bit of time. Uh, because the bar's so low, most people are, are not particularly fit and healthy. So if you want to go to your local park run and out of 100 people be in the top 50, that's not an out of reach achievement. And once you're there, you are legitimately an above average whatever park runner. And you should take huge pride and satisfaction in that. And and yeah, that and, and so I did this thing above average. And then people started saying in the comments, oh, above average, I like that. That's, a, that's actually a cool way of thinking about it. And before I knew it, um, it became a it became a catchphrase um, to the point where initially I kind of rejected it. I was like, "Oh, people stop saying it because it's not." I don't. Want, I'm not an '80s comedian. I don't need a. I don't need a catchphrase. Um, but then I kind of embraced it and thought, actually, no, above average. If everyone loves the idea of being above average, and I was getting emails from people saying, "You know, I'm a, I'm a 65 year old overweight divorcee in Nebraska." but me and my dog are gonna go for a run because we've watched you and we want to be above average compared to other 65 year old divorcee overweight people in Nebraska. I thought, oh, awesome, cool. Then then yeah, if what I'm doing is, is getting people to do that um, and use uh, motivation the way it should be because one of the problems that I've found with my kids and YouTube is that when I grew up, motivation through media was you'd watch Rocky and you'd be motivated. But you'd be motivated to go and box or become Italian American. You'd, go, you'd be motivated to go and do whatever it was you did for your hobby. So you just took the motivation. But what happens with YouTube a lot is people watch something on Instagram or something and they think, oh, that's the body I want. And rather than being motivated by that to then go and do their thing, that they get annoyed because they can't have that body. And, and, and I, that obsession with, um, you know, you're presented an image and because you can't have it, you, you get annoyed and depressed and so on, which is very real. The whole thing's a mess. I mean, it's a mess that people feel like that. It's a mess that people are pretending that people can look like that. The whole thing's a mess. And I look at that whole world and think, what a pity. Why don't you do what I do, which is things like watch Alex Honnold do free solo, where he climbed up El Cap and leave thinking, I'm going for a run. I am so motivated and impressed. I'll never climb in six foot off the ground in my life. But I'm just pumped at what I've seen the human body can do. I'm gonna go and see what I can do. So I love with my YouTube, I do all sorts of things because I'm not saying that anybody copy me, do what I do, do, do if you want, you can. But the idea is you simply finish watching a video and think, that was funny, hopefully. And I'm motivated to go and do something, whether it's be a triathlete or, or do a park run or throw a frisbee. It doesn't matter as long as you're pumped to go out and do your thing. Um, and, and consequently, I don't get too many people giving me the kind of, oh, well, it's easy for you because blah, blah, blah. Because that only applies if you're fixated on being like me, um, which nobody, you know, I never watched Michael Jordan play basketball and thought, well, I can't be like you because I'm not, you know, a, a six or six black American. I just thought, no, I'm... I'm, I'm 50 50% 50 of those things, to be fair. <laughs> I, let's say Shaq then. I'm not, I'm not a server for two. I just thought, I, I'm, I can't... I, I'm just motivated. I, I, I don't... It frustrates me. I, I see my kids all the time. And, and they, they look at social media and the, the form of motivation they take from it is to be like the person they've seen. And that just seems such a narrow use of, of motivation when historically we used to take motivation to then fuel us to go and do whatever we want to do. Sometimes the same thing. I, I, I was motivated by Arnold. I'd be motivated by Arnold to go and do bicep curls. But, but I don't remember people being particularly annoyed that they couldn't be Arnold. There just seemed to be an acceptance that that, that, was, you know, that was up there. Actually, maybe it's this. Arnold was, <clears throat> excuse me, up there and we nor people all down here. One of the problems with YouTube and Instagram and so on is that they're not up there. They're they're just the perception is they're normal people and therefore they're achievable results. But in reality, they're not normal people because if you've navigated your way to the top of YouTube or the top of Instagram, you are 
you're abnormal. You, you simply are. You have, <clears throat> excuse me, something going on. P- purely, purely by percentages. Look, if you look at it that way, exactly. like you, you broke through a very, very saturated market. Indeed, and, and and there are physical attributes that I have genetically. Um, I do have a predisposition to be particularly good at aerobic stuff. Um, I, I just not an average. If you took a hundred people that you tried to get as close to me as possible physically, I, I just I'd naturally be in, in towards the top because because some people are. I'm six foot six. Some people aren't. Some people have amazing uh, you know, the genetic potential for developing musculature, and some people have amazing genetic potential for cardiovascular endurance and stuff. And those people gravitate to the top of social media because of that. And then when we see them there, we think, oh, well, yeah, they're only there because they did what they did. Argue, arguably, they, they'd be pretty close to that, whether they did what they did or not. I mean, Arnold, as an obvious example, would not look too far off of uh, a decent shaped bloke, whether he was bodybuilding or playing football. I mean, he's always going to look like a big jacked guy. It's not, it's not like anybody can do that. And we, but we kind of understood that when we were kids. But now you see the YouTubers running around looking jacked assumption is that you, you can be that so I've really tried hard with YouTube to constantly say to people don't be me don't copy me that's not the point um, you be you motivated by me being me yeah I completely agree and I think the genetic predisposition thing is a lot, something that a lot of people don't understand I mean I'm genetically predisposed to having hypertrophy in my legs a very very high adaptability to new demands because my brother's the same but my upper body is pathetic and that's not something that I then sit and look at somebody benching 180 and think, oh, I wish I could do that. How are they doing that? I just accept that I've got to work within my parameters and therefore excel where I can. But I've had a few comments recently where people are trying to set their expectations of what's achievable for them based on what I've done. And I've sort of thought about, well, why why are you doing that? Surely, surely you understand that the parameters are within your existence, your genetics, your current social circumstances, where you're based, what you have access to, all these things. But... I think it's um, there's too much information available, and often I think I don't think it's just a social media problem. I think tri- triathletes I've seen this with road cyclists. I, I seem to always mention them on podcasts, and I don't have any beef with them, but I don't like this side of what they do. But powerlifters, one of the reasons I left powerlifting was because of these attitudes is seeing people at the top or believing that you are capable of being at the top or being at the top, and then being below that at whatever stage, seeing that person up there. I'm thinking that's what you want to get to. Oh, but that's so far away. Stops you from yeah. beginning, which I think is where the be be above average is such a healthier psychological goal because it means that once you're above average, two, three, four months down the line, you'll have learned what you enjoy. You'll have learned some lessons along the way. It'll probably be a habit, and then without knowing it, three years later, who knows? You might be winning an international powerlifting competition. You might be winning outlaw triathlon you might be doing this you might be doing that and it's happened by accident because you did what you enjoyed and you figured it out along the way rather than thought oh, i want to look like arnold oh well i don't have eight years loads of drugs an era of this to look at you, you can't compare circumstances because your circumstances your own i think that that's something i'm glad you brought up because it's something that i've been struggling to pass com- comment on coherently recently because it's I, I can't comprehend why people try and put their put put themselves within your individual framework because everybody's completely unique which is a good thing as well as a potentially bad thing I mean I think individuality is fantastic and the the phrase I always use whenever I'm speaking at schools on this sort of topic is nobody is better at being you on the planet than you and that's something that we should be proud of and something we should lean into and we should really be happy about because yeah I could lose sleep over the fact I'll never bench four plates do I really care? I'll just play to my strengths, which is lower body dominant. Anybody with a brain will notice that any upper body related challenges on my YouTube do not exist. And there's a simple reason for that. But there might be this illusion that I'm just competent across the board because of certain things, but I'm absolutely not. My upper body is piss weak compared to my lower body. So it's, as we said before, it's all somewhat smoke and mirrors, but it's also learning what your strengths are, learning what lane you exist in. Yes, you can stray one direction or the other. But it's simple things like acknowledging I will never be as strong as I could be if I was just a powerlifter. I will never be as good a triathlete as I could be was I just a triathlete. But at the end of the day, I get more enjoyment and more fulfillment from doing those things side by side on a day-to-day basis, which to me is far more valuable than winning a British triathlon sanctioned race, 
with people that don't want you to win it because they want it to win, and then they don't like you anyway. It's all the, all these all these things going on that just are at play. So, I think the bottom line is someone else's framework is not the blueprint that you should yeah. work with. And and the the thing that I found because I, I I suffered um, hugely as a younger person in my twenties and thirties. I when I was looking for something fun to do, I went through a whole variety of hobbies. I played professional poker for a while. I knew, Kite surfing, kite buggying. I, I took up snooker. I just ridiculous. I, I just randomly started doing different things, trying to find the thing, and I would just become obsessed with being as good as I could be at those things. And one of the things that I, I now relish is that I don't have any desire to be as good as I could be because I can always go and do something else. So, for example, you talk about your your, your bench press. My bench press is appalling. The long arms, six for six, a hundred kilo. PB would that be? I mean, that'd be lovely. I'm, I'm about two kilos off. It's a nightmare, but I don't care because I can jump on the rowing machine and do as I did yesterday: three minute, two second, thousand meter row. And and I bet I bet that still hurts a little bit though, doesn't it? Because <laughs> it was so. But close it will be. It will be under three soon. And and and, and the same. Yeah. You know, now here's a perfect example. Actually, here's a perfect example. I put my I put my. Um, I put my time on and I had one of my guys that follows me on Instagram um, who was an ex NFL player posted his time 245 which is just a bonkers time and the old me would have thought would have been annoyed that someone's faster than me how ridiculous is that but actually I thought actually, no he's not 48 for a start I've got very good at looking at myself relative to where I should be looking at other 48 year olds that aren't professional athletes um, and also he probably can't run a 100k ultramarathon and I can so I've always got something else I can I can go to as an alternative and so I'll, I'll watch people that I watch on YouTube Matt does fitness for example I can watch I can love it I can enjoy his stuff and when I think oh, I, wish I, I wish I had his deadlift I think I don't but if he came to my park run, he'd need hospitalisation afterwards. Because that's he wasn't what... far off it when he ran a 5k with me to confirm. Sorry, Matt, but we have the video evidence, so there's nowhere to hide. Absolutely. And, 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 and equally, I, I doubt he, he, he clearly doubt he's bothered. Um, but that is actually what normal people that, that can't be the, the best should be, should be doing. They should be thinking, OK, I can't do that, but what can I do? And it doesn't even have to be fitness. It can be everybody can do something. But people become so, I mean, triathletes are a great example, aren't they? They just become just completely fixated on spending 15, 16, 17 hours a week training on just this this one thing. And and, and yeah, and never just stop to, to broaden their range of abilities and therefore have a slightly calmer disposition about themselves. I, I don't, well, I understand. Very that. polite, very polite. Well. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, I, I think that the real crux and thread of DNA that runs through this is just simply being open to the fact that other people can enjoy things that you don't or vice versa, or they might not understand why you enjoy the things that you do. And that's perfectly okay. Yes. And that's, that's the summary I try and lead with now is I look at people that are very focused on body composition goals ending themselves with no food to get really lean but it gives them value yes. I don't get it but I can see it gives them value which translates to that's the same value that I get from when I train for a sub 5 minute mile or when I train for this X, Y, Z it's all translatable so I think setting that prejudice aside and setting aside your biases is is a good thing to try and do if you ever have that little why are they doing that in the back of your head just sit and think well do they think why am I doing what I do yeah absolutely or it, it's, yeah. it's the same old if you, if you commit to marathon at a certain age and you leave your weekend warrior mates in the pub they're thinking why is he out running that weirdo as they're sipping their six pint yeah. you might then think that they're weird for having six pints every weekend and eat, no, well I mean obviously a doctor would argue one is better than the other <laughs> but as long as it's a, as long as it's it's, it's it's a healthy a healthy output for all involved and it's giving them the social interaction that they need n one isn't inherently better than the other bad example because one obviously is but for the sake of this example yes. I'm going to go with one isn't inherently better than the other but again if that person then isolates themselves socially, doesn't spend any time with them, then actually they're doing themselves damage by not going to the pub. Absolutely, yeah, indeed. Yeah, like yeah. And, so, and long term, yeah, that that might that might add up to being um, more detrimental. It's um, swings and roundabouts yeah. in this one. It, it comes and goes, doesn't it? But I think um, one thing I'm keen to keen to cover because we kind of missed it in the timeline before 
is there was a period, wasn't there, when you lost all the weight, where there was a bit of a rebound before you really committed to to YouTube, wasn't there? Yeah. Did you go back up to I, 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 Yeah, I went up about, about 250. Actually, one of the things that I've come to terms with, and a part of this is, is being older, not the same for everybody, for me, I found it easier as I got older. I've very much come to terms with the fact that my progression in anything, be it, be it um, leanness, um, my, 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 my run times all over the place, my, my 5K goes up and down, my, my, my strength goes up and down, none of it is linear. Now, for some people it is, and if you're a professional athlete, you probably want it to be, you probably want to be able to look at a graph over the last few years and see a, a linear progression upwards. That's not, that's not how my life works. My life isn't linear. My life um, is, is ups and downs, and I, and I used to worry and think, oh, I've gone backwards. Now I don't care. Um, so I will have always days, sometimes weeks, occasionally months, where something goes wonky. And it might be that my training falls off, it might be my diet falls off, occasionally it might be it all falls off. And I used to panic and worry about that, and now I don't. I just, um, I just, I just kind of roll with those, those punches. Um, to me, um, I hesitate to, to, to kind of bring everything back to, to Rocky, but, um, but everything does go back to Rocky. Um, Rocky, that, that, it's, it's, it kind of starts off going well, Rocky three. I watched Rocky three recently. It starts off going well, then it goes absolutely terribly wrong, and it ends up being okay again. That's an exciting movie. It's like, oh, uh, set up, conflict resolution. That's what you want from a movie. And so when it happens in my life, rather than thinking, oh my god, I spent the last week doing nothing but eating donuts. To me, that's just halfway through Rocky three, getting beat by Clubber Lang, and you know, oh, can I really run down the beach as fast as Apollo? It all comes good in the end, and it's an exciting journey. Is it the most healthy way to go through life, sort of rolling upwards rather than progressing neatly? Maybe not, but it's what most people do. Um, there's no question about that. Uh, the idea that you can, I have people that just say, it's, I mean, it does my head it's slightly, I, I, it's, it's calories in, calories out. You can't beat the laws of thermodynamics. It's as easy as that. I, I get the science, I understand that, but that's that's up there with walking into AA meeting and saying, drink less. It, it, it's, it's, the, it's the nuances, it's the nuances around yeah. how the calories are in or how they are that matters you know, from a psychological let, point let's of view. Put, yeah. we'll, we'll put that 19-year-old you know, TikToker in, in government and he can, he can solve the obesity epidemic overnight apparently because just tell everyone it's calories. There is more to it than that. And so I, I allow myself, um, I don't want to go backwards, but when it happens, I just accept that that is what is going on. Then um, I keep my self sensible. I keep an eye on what's going on. I, I came off. Um, I did a high rocks competition back in April. Spent two months after that, just not really training, not really focusing. Jen's getting into working out, so I focus on what she's doing. I've got a lot going on with the business and YouTube and stuff. I was just very busy, and it all went it all went a bit sideways. But I almost embraced it. I thought, this is good, this is fun, this is exciting. This is like, um, whoa, this is, um, I can't, like I'm dive bombing towards the earth. Let's, let's pull up and soar majestically back to where I should be. That's an exciting way of, of and I'm, I'm pumped at the moment because at the moment I'm getting leaner every day, stronger, faster every day because I'm back on that, that rise back up. I don't worry that I'm kind of back to where I was <laughs> three or four months ago and think oh I'm only back there I don't care I'm ahead of where I was yesterday it's all going great so I I've really embraced um, that that volatility there's obviously limits if I found myself really heavy really out of shape uh, or completely fixated on training non-stop you know there are there's an upper and a lower point that I don't want to bump into but if I'm sort of fluctuating between it with a gen general trend upwards Bearing in mind at 48, it won't always be upwards. There, there will come a point where I have to accept that I will start the trend downwards. Um, I'm happy with it. I'm, 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 and that, that resonates quite well on YouTube because when I do do a video on daft stuff, eating too many donuts, um, I'll be quite jokey about it. But man, some of the emails I get from people that are seriously messed up with their their food compulsions and their disordered eating and so on and and have and are just incredibly appreciative of hearing someone 
say, uh, you know, I, 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 I have that too. Um, doesn't matter. Well, not it doesn't matter. How you feel about it is terrible. But, but what you're doing doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that you have a donut. Feeling terrible about having that donut is the problem. Because if you feel terrible, you're just going to have another donut. You know, you've got to solve how you feel about those things before you can solve those things. And I get, I mean, it's, it's the, the, literally the best part about YouTube is, is daily getting emails from people and DMs and stuff saying, I was here and now I'm here. And it's, it's from watching your daft videos of you running with your dog. Um, and no, you know, I've never seen anyone talk about um, just just not being able to stop eating donuts. And I did a video on, on, on binge eating. I was trying to explain to people that binge eating is not thinking, oh, cheeky me, I had a packet of digestives in one go. Binge eating is is having four packets of digestives and you get to four o'clock in the morning and, and although you feel sick, having another digestive biscuit, it's, it's, it's compulsive eating. And I had people say to me, oh, I've sent your video to my family because they, don't, they, they never understood what I was trying to explain to them. Because because people don't talk about it typically, or if they do talk about it, it's not normally from somebody who's on the surface fit and healthy. They don't, it's not normally coming from that place. Um, so you so say, yeah, so, so for me, I've, I've become very, very uh, accepting of my, um, yeah, my, my rolling, my undulating uh, performance. The reason I asked isn't just to, let's highlight the rebound, Mark, you fell off the wagon, none of that at all, but more because I was interested if you ever thought about why overconsumption or that binging is your default in those situations or, or where that compulsion comes from. Is it something you've ever confronted or is it something that by the sounds of things you, you've just accepted for part of who you are and you now know how to better manage it and why you're feeling that way at the time so you can have confidence that this will pass. So just ride it out and see Absolutely what happens. Absolutely that. I, 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 there, there is, I'm sure, something um, in me, whether it was born with or whether it was developed as a kid I don't know but there's there's something in me that um, yeah causes me to, um, to to just yeah compulsively overeat on occasion and um, and I I've been close to people suffering um, with alcoholism and and I hesitate to use the comparison but but I, I've seen people unable to do nothing but take a drink even though it is going to cost them everything. And I've been the same with a biscuit. And people think, well, it's not the same, it's biscuits. It is, it, the, the, mechan the mechanism psychologically is the same, isn't it? I don't want it, I feel sick, I don't, I don't need it, it's terrible for me, and I'm gonna eat it, and I do eat it. Um, so it, it is literally the same in that sense. Yeah, I, I, if someone said to me, we can, I don't know, lay you on the couch and, and uh, ask about your mother uh, or, or, and find out where it's where it's from. I suppose I'd be interested, but I'm not overly, I'm not. It might, it might, it sounds like it doesn't, sounds like it doesn't matter to you. It doesn't matter. I'd be, I'd be interested, yeah. but it doesn't matter because I can, I can control it. I accept it. it it's, um, it, do you know a daft example? It's a bit like, it's a bit like if I had one hand, I'd have learned how to get around with one hand to a certain extent. How I lost my hand, well, and, and you know, the, I can't do anything about it. It'd be interesting. Oh, where did my hand go? But it doesn't affect now. What's more important now is how do I get by with one hand? How do I get by with knowing that I have these compulsions? And there's things I can do. You know, I don't have a house filled with junk food and stuff. And, and when they come on, I'm, I'm very vocal to Jen and the kids and explain. At the moment, I'm eating too much. So yeah, bear that in mind. And it's ridiculous, but the kids, for example, won't leave chocolate and sweets downstairs. They'll have it up in their bedroom because it's left downstairs and I'm in that place. I'll eat it. Um, so I'm not sure whether they're trying to help me or they're just trying to preserve their, protect their protect. food. <laughs> Either way, it doesn't matter. <laughs> the outcome's the same. Yeah, 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 exactly. So no, I'm interested in it, but I'm not, um, I'm not overly interested in it. It was, um, it was very good to see you talk about the, the sort of, I, I coin it, the post-event come down I, I've called it post-event depression because I, ha I have been diagnosed as depressed in the past and it's a very similar it's a very similar state of mind however I think because it's temporary from a isolated moment in time I, I, I tend not to call it post-event depression I tend to call it a come down in the sense that 
the, you really had it with High Rocks, didn't you? Where there was a big yeah. build up and process. I'm talking about this on YouTube. This is how I'm training. I've got this new bit of kit. I've got this. I've got that. It's done. Boom. Crash. And I knew it was going to happen. I mean, that, that's the annoying that, thing. That's what's, that's what's fascinating. Is, is, oh, I knew it was coming. I, I, I know they come after every event. And it took me almost a month post Keltman, even though I put every little bit of planning in place ahead of time to make sure it didn't happen. It took me four weeks to feel myself again. So I think it's, uh, as you've said, fluctuating, yeah. fluctuating between those two parameters and knowing that that's it is the I, best I, thing to I do. I felt a bit embarrassed because I did a, I did a video on the, the, the top five ways to not binge eat immediately after High Rocks more for my benefit to remind myself that I know how to not binge eat than for viewers. The, 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 the nice thing about it is that I got an awful lot of people saying to me that was incredibly beneficial for me, and I, which is nice because I think good because it, it was useless for me. I went and did exactly what I shouldn't do. I mean, I, yeah, I, I knew it was going to come. I, we were going on a holiday after the High Rocks um, and that was it. I just sat on the beach eating food. I mean, every everything just combined. I, I, I no longer had to focus the next High Rocks event was miles away. YouTube was doing well. I, I've always, I have always done worse when I rested on my laurels. So for me, when things are an absolute disaster, I've had times in my life where I thought things are now disastrous. Uh, but I've always managed to uh, not not be upbeat about that at all. It's wrong wrong description. But I've always been positive about knowing I can pull myself out of it. But when things are going great, I just let my guard down every time. I mean, I, I just know it's going to happen. It's, it's, it's annoying. I, well, I say it's annoying. It's kind of not annoying now because I know it's going to happen. Actually, when you know something's going to happen, how can you be annoyed about it? It's just, it just is what it is. It'd be like me, you know, I don't know, whatever. Um, it, it's just inevitable. You can't be annoyed about it, inevitable. Not for 48 years, you can't. You have to yeah, let it go at some point. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it happened. Um, and I just waited. I, it took two months. Um, I just waited because I know that if I try and do so too soon, if I get up one day and think, I don't feel like it, but today's the day, I mean, that just doesn't work for me. Um, I just uh, the main thing as well, and what I learned, and I actually had a conversation with Lucy Davis, who's just done her first 100K recently. Yeah, yeah, well. did, yeah. In a ridiculous um, time. Uh, yeah, she's a, she's an animal, an absolute yeah, animal. That time just, just, was <laughs> obscene. Having done my first hundred k last year, um, and, and uh, yeah, her time was bonkers. I don't, I don't know how that is possible that she. Did. She was a she was a, a GB just athletically gifted. Well, indeed, but even uh, yeah, even even looking at if you look on paper, even at her history, um, her, her sporting history, because of her, her physicality. It doesn't. It wouldn't appear to translate to 100 kilometer ultramarathon money. Absolutely stunning. I mean, just I was blown away by that time. I, I, I kind of guessed what she'd do, and was just, yeah, I, phenomenal, phenomenal. Amazing, wasn't it? Yeah. Amazing. She, she, she messaged me because because we spoke about it the whole process. Um, just just on a few things, and she messaged me basically. I could have paraphrased it as some a message I would have sent to myself four weeks previously whereby she was saying she couldn't get back into training, she couldn't get back into the day-to-day, -day, and this was week one and a half or something after yeah. the race. Um, and I think the main thing is, and it sounds like you're very much in the same camp, is yes, try and fight up against the sort of feelings of the, the sort of come down, let's coin it, but don't be hard on yourself if that day isn't the day. Yeah. If, you've, if you've done your best and done what you could that day, that's all you, that you could do that day. And I think that's kind of what I said to Lucy is that she wasn't unique in any way to be feeling that way. And that even recently, with all the foresight in the world, it took me a full month after the peak of the Keltman, the prep, the planning, pulling the video together, getting everybody up there, making sure we had enough food because there's no infrastructure in the Highlands. Yeah. All of a sudden, I'm at home and I'm getting to enjoy a Domino's and not worrying about something for a day. But then the following day... I'm thinking, oh, you should probably relax. But if I relax, then my life feels a bit different. So what I've actually found is that the best thing I can do is have something ready and waiting to get my teeth stuck into and don't abandon any of the habits that actually act as real anchors to keep me stable on a day-to-day -day basis. But if I'm a little bit wobbly for a couple of weeks, for a month or so, do my best. But don't be hard on myself if it's not going the way that I'd hoped because there's nothing I can do other than ride ride this wave. Yeah, no, I've, I've just got... Because I... I... I like the idea that I am in good shape because of good habits rather than particular goals. But I, I'm a big habits fan rather than goals fan. Um, although I like goals, habits is what day-to-day -day keeps me where I want to be. 
but but yeah, it just it, it, it's, it's frustrating. I had no goal, immediate goal, and sometimes the habits. I, mean, I have my entire life set up for for me to be able to just fall into what I do. I mean, it's my gym is around the corner. I, there's there's nothing in the way of me. You know, I, I look at some people say, well, I, I struggle to get to the gym because whether my baby was awake or night, and then I had to do a nine to five, and then I had to, you know, the, I've got no excuse. I can get out of bed whenever I like and go to the gym around the corner from my house. It's like, I'm incredibly lucky. And, and and so I do sometimes think, what the heck is wrong with me? I, there's nothing, there's no hurdle in the way. It's actually quite hard for me not to work out. Um, what am I doing? But I used to beat myself up over it. And now I always chuckle to myself and think, that's quite funny that my gym is literally I could throw a stone and hit it, but I can't bother to go to it. Um, I don't know why that is. I don't care. It doesn't really matter. I'll make a YouTube video about it. I know that one day, pretty soon, I'm going to be going back there. And, and that time that, that came, it, it, it literally took two months. I just, I just remember thinking, oh, I really feel like cracking on now. And, and since that, that moment, I've, I've, I've been back into it. Have I got into it back in sooner? This is what happened when I, you mentioned a few years ago when I, when I really went backwards, back to about 250 pounds of weight. That was almost entirely caused by forcing myself to, to try and rectify the problem before I was rectified, before I was ready to rectify the problem. Um, which adds emotional stress the other way because you're being hard on yourself for trying hard and not succeeding, which yeah. means that the negative patterns then exacerbate the already negative patterns because you haven't managed to beat the negative patterns and well, feel indeed, the spiral. Because if you, if, you have, if, you, if you have three or four attempts at getting back on track and you don't, you... Um, you then just start rightly assuming that well, how the last three attempts have failed, the fourth will probably fail too. So it's like um, it's like we we do a Spartan and you uh you, you run up to the monkey bars or something and, and you fall off. Um, the, the gut reaction is jump back up and have another go. Actually, what you need to do is stop, take a minute, uh, let other people go past you, get ready, and then when you're ready, nail it. Don't exhaust yourself having three or four failed goes because then when you go for your fifth go. Mentally, you're just thinking, I'm going to fail because I just keep failing anyway, and so why would it change? And you're right because you're exhausted from it. So for me, it's, um, yeah, I do so I think I get off an obstacle and I kind of walk around pacing, just tell myself, ignore people running past me, uh, go when I'm ready. And the same applies with, um, with thinking, today's the day when I'm going to, um, yeah, have a, have a protein shake rather than a, um, well, actually, <laughs> what I do, I have terrible habits here. What I'll do is I'll always have my protein shakes, but I'll add chocolate chips to them when I'm off the wagon. Um, and so what then happens is my, I can always tell how focused I am because the ratio of chocolate chips to protein shake swings in favor of protein shake um, normally. But, but during uh, an off season, off, an off period, it could be more chips than shake. Um, I feel like this is an elaborate troll to try and get people to put chocolate chips in their protein shakes, and you're just going to be sitting sitting from the chair and now laughing at these crunchy protein shakes that people are having. But it's uh, it, it, it's almost like a, it, it, it's it's fascinating that that ratio exists. I'm trying to think if I've got an equivalent. I think there was a stage where I think I had th Domino's three nights out of seven in a week because I was in that position, and I think it was the third one where I thought you're just milking this, oh, I need to take a rest yeah. side of things, and then started to slowly move back the other direction. But I wouldn't have got to that direction as fast had I not as gone had I not gone in the other direction as aggressively. Yeah. So it's all, we're all the same, really, yes, aren't we? We're indeed, all the same. Yeah, but yeah. I'm conscious that this is getting quite long, but there's two two or three things I want to cover off before sure. we go, which is, I mean, the, the one that you talk about so frequently, and have, I mean, 125, 126,000 subs now. Exponential yeah. growth from what is obviously an enormous, enormous amount of effort, focus, deliberation, consideration that goes into each YouTube video. So very, very quickly, do you want to just give us an overview of the evolution of your YouTube channel and then some just top line advice for anybody that might be in that situation like we described before, where they see your channel they want to start a YouTube channel, but oh, I don't want to because I want to be like Mark, but I'm not there yet, so I'm not going to bother. What, what, what are the bits of advice you'd give people to, to get things moving? And then we'll move on to your actual process for creating a video because I think it's very unique and something that I, I would learn a lot from personally. Um, yeah, I, it's true. I, I'm actually a member of a couple of uh, subreddits and stuff for things like new YouTubers. And, and I, I do try to give advice because the, one, the mistake that I see a lot of people making is um, that they, 
YouTube is um, making a YouTube video. It, it's an artistic endeavor. When you're making a movie, uh, it's no different to writing a song or, or painting something. Or you're creating something that you then show people or play to people, and they then like or, or don't like. Um, it's creative. And if you look at any other uh, comparable, let's say you, you're a, you're a guitarist. Here's what a YouTuber, a new YouTuber would do with a guitar. They'd go to a guitar showroom, they'd buy the guitar. Before they'd even learn a chord, they'd be online asking about how to monetize their guitar skills. And then they'd be asking about where they can find the best promoter to promote their concert. And you think, hang on a minute, have you learned a chord yet? So there is an assumption that you can just go straight into being a YouTuber in, in the way that it doesn't exist with any other artistic um, outlet. Um, and of course, there are some YouTubers who, who just do get lucky like that. But then occasionally there'll be a Jimi Hendrix that picks up a guitar and can just be Jimi Hendrix. That isn't how most people play. play. Casey Neistat. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah. But then even, see, Casey Neistat's a perfect example because look at Casey Neistat's history. You know, the guy was doing film school stuff and studying under some incredibly good... Yeah, yeah, so very true, very he, true. He wasn't, yeah. And a vlog a day, a vlog a day, which is an enormous Absolutely. amount of effort. It's not, yeah. he didn't just walk no, into it, did he? Not at all, no. And, and, and then you'll get people that say, oh, I've been, I've been, you know, I read it every day. People say, oh, I've got four videos now, I've got 15 subscribers, is that a good ratio? Like, who cares? Who cares? Make 100 videos, do it for two years, then step back, or do it for a year at least, and then step back and think, where am I? Am I enjoying it? Are people liking it? Am I enjoying it? it, it, it it's... You'll find out if you're if you're cracking it because people will be telling you it's 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 not it's like learning guitar. My kid's learning guitar every day. He gets a little bit better playing guitar in his bedroom. He's not asking me about getting a you know how, how do you book out the O2 because why would he? And yet in YouTube land, there's that. So so don't think that you can just start making any reasonable amount of money um, anytime soon unless you are. Well, unless you are so unusual that it's an irrelevance to even contemplate, I mean, it's, it's pointless. You might as well say, well, what if I win the lottery? Well, yeah, what if? So, so there's that. The other side is that what I did, and this is, this is useless advice for most people, especially younger people, is I'm a big believer in starting as you mean to go on. And what most people call that is all the gear, no idea. Um, I thought, Casey Neistat uses an iMac, he uses Final Cut Pro, he uses um, my first camera that cost me a fortune um, and already I replaced and upgraded it. I, I basically threw money because I was able to at what I thought would, would be the best way of going about it and, and, and that worked for me because I, I was trying to compensate for not actually knowing a huge amount about my subject matter. But, but it actually did work because it meant that things like the, the production quality and so on does, I was going to say masks, it, it, it's not so much about masks, it, if you're sitting down and watch something in, I, I, I changed my camera to a decent uh, 4K camera, I suddenly, I enjoyed watching my stuff more. When I watch my old videos now in 1080 or whatever it would have been, I'm, I think well, that looks horrible. So if you've got the means uh, to treat it like a business, then don't be afraid to treat it like a business. Now, if I tell people how much I spend setting it up, people are, are, think it's a huge amount of money. But if I told them I set up a cafe, and I set up a cafe for 10, 15 grand, people think, okay, that sounds like a pretty cheap investment to set up a cafe, actually. Uh, and, and, and my YouTube is making more than most cafes. So, and you don't get people, you don't get people in subreddits asking, I've sold four coffees, how can I make loads of money now, do you? Yeah. It's, it's, you, you, you don't set, everybody's assumption is I'm going to start a YouTube to make loads of money and it's probably 10 years of graft, a lot of luck and hundreds of thousands of pounds investment to even start to really make money that you wouldn't make in a white collar job. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. The, 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 the subreddit equivalent would be people saying, um, I can't yet make a coffee, but um, I've designed a logo for my coffee shop. My mum thinks it looks good. Um, you know, tell me about business rates, and you're like, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm going to sign. I'm going to sign a ten ten year lease on <laughs> in central London yeah. based on this. Um, but oh no, that sounds like a lot of money to to invest. No, yeah. don't mind that. And, and the, other, the other thing as well, I, I, I should add, you you have to have 
um, this sounds obvious, you have to have something. Too many people, I've got very good at looking at people that I can't stand on YouTube and understanding what the thing is they have. Even though I don't get it, I might hate it. I watch a lot of people um, that I used to think, but they're just useless. And, but actually when you stop and, and have an open mind, you don't have to like what they're doing, but nobody on YouTube has got millions of followers without having something. Might not be your cup of tea, but, but there's something. Um, a lot of people mistake not liking what somebody is doing to thinking, therefore, it's easy to do. Uh, I can remember my dad, <laughs> years ago, saying, oh, the Spice Girls are rubbish, they can't all sing. And me thinking, are you nuts? They're rubbish. They're like the biggest band in the world right now. How can they be rubbish? That do you not understand. And that happens with YouTube. People say, oh, that, that bloke's, that, whatever. Logan Paul, ah, oh, bloke's an idiot. Well, can't be, can't be, because, <laughs> because multi-millionaire YouTubers, so can't be, must be absolutely nailing it, just not your cup of tea. Don't think that person I don't like, therefore I don't value, therefore you don't need to do something of value to be successful. No, you do, it needs to be a value of somebody. So I'm very confident that what I do is not a value of everybody, but, but the, the, the jokes, the movie clips, the way I put it together, I'm confident that it is of value. And if you can't look at your own stuff and, and see the value in it, I literally, when I watch back my videos, the good ones, I laugh at my own stuff. It sounds incredibly self-indulgent, egotistical, but I, I should be laughing at it, shouldn't I? Because it's funny. It's supposed to be funny. If I'm not laughing at it, why do I want, why would I expect anybody else to laugh at it? So you've got to be confident in what you're doing. You know, watch your stuff back. And if you don't think that's actually pretty good, um, then, then, you know, learn more get better what what's my my very first videos that i did rewriting around africa with jen uh i watch those now and i think do you know what actually storytelling the little arc i put in there pretty good i'm i'm still proud of those and so yeah so many people uh, are not proud of their work don't see the value in what they do and then wonder why nobody else is watching it um yeah so so be be confident in what you're doing and if you're not confident in what you're doing ask yourself whether it's, you're even cut out for it, number one. And if you think you really are, then, then set about getting better. Don't just expect um, people to start liking you irrespective of you improving or not. That won't happen. No, and the same reason it doesn't happen in any other industry on the planet. <laughs> well, other than maybe, maybe, and this might even be me being a bit cynical at a younger age than you are, but maybe TikTok, because you can't just blow up for doing nothing. Which is still rather, it's a rabbit hole. It's a rabbit hole. So I, th I think actually the best thing to do I, at I've, I've, one hour and 20, 26 minutes of recording time is potentially. Well, well yeah, I get 10 seconds on TikTok. I've spent the last week on TikTok, watching TikTok relentlessly to try and do what I just said and learn the value in things that I don't see the value in. And <laughs> I'm not there yet. The, but yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's the least value adding platform, in my opinion. Um, but it has its place in the modern world yeah. in which we exist. I'm, and as I'm a trying to find what that is because I genuinely, I, I do believe that if something's if something's liked by millions of people, there's something there. I'm just, yeah. I'm just trying to see what it is. Agreed, agreed. Penultimate question. We'll we'll try and be as concise as possible. Yeah. It doesn't matter how long it takes. But if everyone, anybody's still listening at this point, well done you. You can break it up into two if needed. But your process for a YouTube video. How is it put together? Do you work forwards? Do you work backwards? Do you think of a thumbnail and a title and then work backwards? How do you put it together? Do you use a teleprompter a lot? I know, but yeah. is that something you use for everything? Do you know what clip you're going to use? I've, I've got a lot of questions personally, but for people listening, what is your process that has given you that exponential growth that we've seen recently on your channel? I, I start with a, a subject. Um, so I have a list of things I want to do a video about. Um, and some of those will be dictated by, for example, my, my video I'm doing today is on my sit-stand desk that I'm, I'm sat at, um, and the benefits of a sit-stand desk. And that's partly because genuinely I've been amazed at the benefits of standing up for the last 30 days, and also because the company sent me a sit-stand desk. So I need to do a video on it, that's part of the deal. I get a cool bit of kit, I need to do a video. So I have some videos that are simply like that. And, I, and, if, and by the way, if it was a piece of junk, uh, I, I don't do a video on it, so it's, it's quite easy. People say, well, everything you talk about you like. Well, because if it's rubbish, I won't, I won't tell you about it. I'm only going to promote stuff that's, that I like. So some stuff is dictated by circumstance like that, but I still have to have a belief in it. 
Some stuff is dictated by what I'm doing, so high rocks, Jen, get, the next video we're doing is progress report on how Jen's got on with the last three months of training. Um, and some stuff is dictated by me just thinking that will work well. Um, I'm in contact at the moment with a guy that is um, a um, elite level speed walker um, because his times are my run times. I can't think of anything more incredible than to race over say 10k, somebody that will beat me walking. That would be an amazing video I think. Um, to show people what appears to be almost a joke sport, um, no, there's something quite incredible going on there. So some things like that. Um, so I start with a subject and then I, I write a script for it, like I did with my stand-up comedy. I literally just write a script, start to finish, every single word, every uh, pause, look, uh, every, everything is scripted. Um, and then, yeah, I stick it on my teleprompter, I film it, I end up with therefore just a, a raw footage of me talking to camera and over the top of that, and within that, I will then overlay graphics and stuff. The film clips, I tend to come up with as I'm scripting it. So, um, uh, for example, on the, um, on the sit-stand desk, I had a statistic for the, for the NHS about how astronauts in zero gravity um, suffered muscle loss and how they link that to sitting down and not standing up, which seemed a rather big leap to make. Anyway, it sent me off to find a uh, Houston We Have a Problem clip. Uh, so that goes in there, although not the Houston We Have a Problem clip because that's a bit obvious. So that's how those things come up. I think, oh, astronauts, that sounds like a good place for a movie clip. And I kind of throw it all together. I mean, it really is as straightforward as that. And one of the nice thing about scripting it, exactly the same as standard comedy, is that you can go through the script and you can think, has there been more than 30, 40 seconds without me saying something at least slightly funny? Um, is there a is there a start, a middle, and an end? Is it, it does, does it does it wrap up? Does the end call back to something from earlier on? Is there does it is it a package? And it's a it's a thing that most YouTubers, especially in the fitness world, don't tend to do. Um, it, their stuff tends to be a bit more sort of um, vloggy, you know. Um, uh, yeah, kind of welcome to the video, and here we are in. You know, this is what I'm doing today, and. Uh, and here's me drinking my coffee in the morning and it's all it's that but I didn't want to do that and also I found it really hard to do that I found it really hard because I tried it to just talk to the camera about what I'm going to do I'd stumble my words I'd, and I, you end up with the classic youtube -y jump cut all over the place to hide your mistakes and your stumbles I didn't I don't maybe because I'm old I just didn't like that that isn't filmmaking filmmaking to me I wanted it to look like a smooth, seamless production, uh, and the way to do that was to script it. I mean, it, it kind of sounds obvious, but but nobody was was is doing it really. In 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 other YouTube fields, they do it. In fact, the guy that I watch, I forget his name, but he's a guy who does lots of YouTube filmmaking stuff, and, and he's using a teleprompter because obviously, like why? I mean, when the first time you use one, you suddenly think. Why have I not been doing this all the time? I don't need to go back and edit. I don't need to change what I... I you just read what you've said um, or what you've written. Uh, the only time I change that around is if I'm out and about. So this weekend, me and Jen are doing a high rock simulation. We're going to be obviously out and about. And we'll be doing some filming while we're out and about. Although what I quickly learned, and the high rocks video has taught me this, there's two ways of doing that. I could film and talk while I'm out and about, which would be the traditional format for doing a fitnessy video. Um, you will jump out of your car at the beach and say, here I am at the beach and it's cold and I'm gonna go for a swim. Um, I can't do that because I'd, I'd stumble over my words. So what I do is I jump out of the car, uh, wherever I am, and I do what I'm doing, and then back in the office, I'll do commentary that I've scripted and is funny over the footage of me doing what it is that I did. And so I have complete control over, over that process. And so my High Rocks videos, every time I go to High Rocks, I film myself in the hotel, vloggy, and then I go and do the event, and I come back to the office and I delete all that vloggy stuff, it's all junk. I simply take the footage of me competing, and I do a funny commentary over the top. Um, 
and I, I can then structure it exactly how I want. It's very, it's, it's kind of cheating, um, but it, but it works for me. No, it's something I've been reflecting on recently. Is that I need to be more concise on many things, and I I try and try and try to do it whenever Campbell, the guy that does my filming for me, turns up at a certain time to do this video, and I've got my topic list, but. I don't have subcategories or sentences, so I just then talk for longer than I want to on the topic. I think now we can do that more concise. Do it again. It's five seconds less. Think okay. Once again, I just get frustrated. So I'm uh, I'm currently doing a bit of an overhaul of how I can reapproach videos with a telepromptery, more planned, more prepped element. But my challenge is with uh, YouTube not being full time. It's actually a bit of a bolt on, and sometimes at the moment feels like a bit of a chore on top of everything else, which is something I'm very keen to fix because I don't want it to because I do enjoy it, but sometimes th the amount of detail and thought that goes into it can feel like one bridge too far. So that's something that I need to fix, but um, I also want to endeavor to be more concise, and I think a teleprompter is the way to yeah. do that in some, in some ways, but just probably more diligent planning and more specific planning and storyboarding and how things are gonna look. But it also opens up certain videos that I can do where I can concisely go point by point and just sit here in my office and do it. Because the way that I need to film things, filming a brick session, whilst we do put a lot yeah. of effort into doing it, as I hope comes across, is a massive yeah. pain in the yeah. arse for all involved. We need a driver, we need somebody, we need this, we need a route plan. We, it's just a nightmare and whilst the videos come out well I can sometimes ruin it by not being too concise or it means that it, it's just so much time to go in for what ultimately you could get the same reward from for something with a bit more prep done yeah. right here so that that's my sort of my sort of uh, lessons I've taken from no, you the, the, script, the scripting so I, it, it is it is massively time consuming but but the the I mean I, I every evening I, I sit in my sauna for an hour and I, that's where I write my scripts but but having written the script I then have to go over it again and again and again to make it sound um, not scripted. And that involves things like putting in pauses or, or making it look like I'm appearing to think of something off the cuff. That, and people, when they first hear that, I use the telephone to say, they're almost a bit disappointed. They thought, oh, I thought it was... Uh, I said, hang on a minute, when you go and watch stand-up, are you disappointed? When you watch a movie, a TV show, when you watch the news, every single thing you ever watch, when you listen to your favourite song, do you not think that started as words on a page? Are you disappointed that you know Springsteen broke down Thunder Road on a bit of paper first and then sung it? Actually, everything that's of any value, Shakespeare onwards, starts off with someone thinking, what do I want to say? And then perfecting it on the page and then saying it. That's actually historically a very normal way of doing it. Actually, the YouTube way of doing it of just, welcome, and here I am, and here's what, and that's actually a weird modern way of doing it that we've just gotten used to. So, um, yeah, I think when people watch my, my stuff, although it is scripted, I, I, I think people, certainly people over 25, 35, it's, it's just like watching a TV show. You know, when you, when you watch your whatever, people have called me the Top Gear of Fitness. Um, all scripted, Clarkson and his little buddies, all, all made up in advance. None of those off-the-cuff jokes are off-the-cuff. It's all, you know, same stand-up comedy. Oh, I saw the guy... Oh, it was riffing. It was off the cuff. It was just as no, it wasn't. He wrote it. Every single. Every, no, nobody is that intelligent. Yeah, exa exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I've known some amazing um, stand-up people from having worked in that that that, that world, and uh, every single thing is scripted. There's a couple of people that, that are a bit more um, off the cuff, but even when they're off the cuff and they're dealing with hecklers, they're using lines that they've practiced and used a thousand times before. Um, so I I very comfortably went into. Uh, the teleprompter script world uh, with no hesitation that it was a genuine way of, of, of presenting my thoughts um, exactly as I wanted to get them across. And the, within this, 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 this podcast, I've always noticed on podcasts, if I try and do it off the cuff, it, it, it goes on forever. Um, and actually, when, when I'm strict with what I'm going to say, and I look, to, I look on the page at the words, um, I do what I used to do in stand up. I look at the page on the, on the, the words and I literally take a pen. Don't do that word, don't do that word, don't do that word. And you end up with a really tight, um, yeah, concise presentation of what it is you want to get across. It's definitely something I want to get better at. It's, uh, it's just for me, it's reframing my workflow around everything else to be able to make sure that I can do it well rather than just just cutting corners, as it were. But that's my problem. I'm very, I'm very lucky. I look, I look at guys like you with, with a million things on the, on the go. And I'm very lucky that, that um, once my business is, is out of the way, 
it's just YouTube. I get emails every day from people, bizarrely, saying things like, do you do training programs? Do you... No, 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 nothing. But what I do is I make videos and that is it. I, so so when I do sit down and do a video, for me it's almost, um, I, I do enjoy it. I, I love making, I love the whole process. If I thought, oh, God, do a video, um, I, I, yeah, I'd, as you say, I'd question. I, 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 I feel like that at the moment. I actually, uh, yesterday I was meant to film a full day of something, full day of eating it was meant to be, and I just woke up and I thought, nope, I do not want to pick up this thing here. I just, I had it, yes. I, it was out in the hallway, yeah. it was charged, it had an SD card in it, everything was laid out ready to go. And I just thought, oh, the last thing, I've got a busy day today, which is why I'm filming it. But the last thing I want to do is add another element to that. And I've, re, re, I've punted it to Friday to try and make it work because, but that's not because I don't enjoy it. It's because I've got so many other things going on that I need to manage. It's, yeah. it's my own time management to make sure that I can fit the work in. I can fit the filming in around the work if I'm going to approach it that way. But my problem. And you've got to be in the right frame. Exactly. Because exactly. it, it, it comes, otherwise it comes across like you're not, you know, Here's my typical day. Me being miserable. <laughs> oh, this is horrendous. Nobody, nobody do what I do. Nobody do what I do. But fi- yeah. final question, kind of in the same vein. At this point in your career, your existence, your you've got you've got sort of children that have, have lived through teenage years, and, and obviously you've got a lot of things on the horizon. What does success mean to you at this point in your life? Well, having got all my children, I've got one about to turn 16 when he hits 18 that's family success because I needed to get all my children to 18 um, alive and well and not and not. I failed actually wanted to get arrested that's because they're not arrested not in prison didn't go to prison they, they stole a rowing boat they let him out after he uh, said sorry for stealing the rowing boat um, did he did he so, row, row away in it was it was it a rowing Grand Theft Auto or was it because I can't imagine they're easy things to steal him and some mates went to a golf club and, uh, during COVID and they, they found a rowing boat and they jumped in it and they rowed into the middle of a lake and um, the police turned up because somebody reported them and uh, they rowed back to the police um, and effectively handed themselves in which involved getting um, handcuffed face down in, in, on the bank of a river like a, like a Quentin Tarantino reboot of Wind in the Willows. Um, <laughs> And, and and taken and taken to the local cop shop. Why not jump out of the boat or sort of paddle to the other side? Like I'm 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 all for following. The, 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 the good the, thing is, the good the, thing is, you can tell you've raised him as a terrible criminal. So <laughs> well, 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 yes, indeed. Yeah, I suppose there, there is that. So he got arrested, but but that's minor, a minor misdemeanor. Um, so children sorted, hopefully. Touch wood. Um, and, and I, I, I Joe, as a, as a as a dad with children that are grown, there is an incredible. Uh, freedom that comes with that, and I, I, I feel um, almost like my my job is done as a human being. Um, I kind of feel like I'm on not borrowed time or bonus time, but I'm just on free time. It's like you've done what you're here to do, kind of procreate um, more than enough. Four kids is is uh, you, you've uh, you've done your job and then some. Um, kind of do what you like. So I don't really, I don't think about success I just literally think what what sounds cool and what sounds cool to me is being able to make a couple of videos a week which is what I'm going to step up production to when the, when the other half of my business is gone um, and just have fun and, and I'm filming me mucking about and that helps me stay in shape because typically I'm doing things that keep me in shape um, yeah I, I don't think about success I don't I, don't, I just think what well, what's a cool thing to be doing today Oh, that's what I do for a job. Um, it really is as simple as that. We just, um, okay, here's, uh, here's an example of, of, of where my life is at. I have a BMW X3 four litre fancy pants car. It's going, because it's it's just boring. Is it, is, it, is, it an M, is it an MX3, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's, it's getting rid of that, that's corporate and horrible. Uh, Jen and I yesterday went to look at a Jeep Wrangler Rubicon. That's my fiance's uh, dream car. Okay, well we are getting one, um, a two door, because when you take the doors and the roof off, you you literally look like you're in Baywatch. Um, and it just, it's nuts. I test drove it and it's nuts. It's, it's, it's horrible, bouncy and what, I mean, it's a Jeep. But I thought, I don't actually go that far. Where, where do I go? And if I go to a Spartan and the field's muddy and I have to park in it, how cool am I gonna look? Um, and occasionally it might pop up in the background on YouTube 
and, and what a cool, fun thing. Um, that's, that's where I'm at. I'm, I'm in a place now where I can just think, that's a bit nuts, but pff, what the hell? So there, there I, 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 yeah. So, so, so when you see a, a yellow, um, gee, actually it's not yellow, it's called nacho cheese. Uh, when you say oh, nacho cheese, I feel a bit uncomfortable. Actually, that's such a strange. Well, uh, uh, it's a, not, a not, not, not very farrow and ball, is it? It's, uh, no, indeed. No, as, as a vegan, uh, I don't get to eat cheese, so I, I, so at least I get, I get to drive the car. This kind of cheese. Um, yes, it's bonkers, but I, I just get to have that. that. That's kind of where my life is now. I don't, I don't view that as a sign of success. It just happens to be where I'm lucky enough to be. And, um, and and it means I go to bed at night just kind of chuckling to myself that um, all is well. Well, from my perspective, it sounds like, by definition, you have found it. Therefore, you don't need to really think about what it means anymore. So, well done, <laughs> I think. And, you yeah, know, it's, it's obviously come through a very significant evolution, which we covered off in the longest episode to date. So, thank you very much for your time. Much well, appreciated. Well, I'm, I'm quite old, so there's a, there's a lot of years. You, you're getting as much in now before before there's no time left. Is that what it is? <laughs> One long podcast. But no, thank you very much. Where can people find you? Mark Lewis on YouTube and Instagram is? Yeah, Mark, Mark Lewis Picks on Instagram. Um, yeah, marklewis.co.uk for the website. But yeah, Mark Lewis on YouTube is... Um, and there's Patreon and YouTube and Patreon of the website as well. Yeah, as well. All, link, all linked off of YouTube. They, they should go to YouTube and they should watch my South African motorcycle videos. I was get, that was You've stolen my closing line because you've said <laughs> things subtly that mean he clearly wants people to go and watch it. He's yeah. bitter about the fact it doesn't have more views than it does. So anyway, my closing sentence was go and watch Mark's first video ever because he's very proud of it. But nonetheless, yeah, thank proud. you very much for your time. And uh, yeah, speak very soon. You're welcome. Thank you.